The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome everyone to Useful Social Media's webinar on social media compliance and risk management. Over the next 50 minutes we'll be discussing how to achieve effective and efficient social compliance whilst monitoring and mitigating risk. Uh, my name is Jack Edgar, I'm the project director here at Useful Social Media and I'll be hosting today's webinar. And the webinar actually forms part of the agenda for this year's Corporate Social Media Summit taking place in New York on June the 15th and 16th. Both Laurie and Lisa will be there speaking alongside 40 senior executives from the world's most social brands. Now before we get started with today's discussion, I just want to remind you that we are recording the webinar, so everyone will receive the audio recordings early next week. The webinar is also very much interactive, so we have several anonymous polls taking place throughout the discussion, so please do vote and get involved. I also urge you to type in your own questions. Uh, that would be into the question box on the right-hand side. Again, these are very much anonymous. So we can ensure that the insight is indeed tailored to your challenges and your priorities. I'll be incorporating these into the discussion as we go. Uh, we're also using the hashtag CSMNY, which you can see on the right-hand side of the slide. So again, any questions or additional thoughts, please do share them. Now joining us today, uh, joining us today I should say, um, I'm delighted to introduce firstly Laurie Hale, He's the VP, a Social Media Compliance Officer at Bank of the West. Rohit Valia, who's the CEO of Caffeine, and Lisa Melton, the Assistant Vice President of Marketing at Amica Mutual Insurance. Welcome to each of you. Now, before we get started with the discussion and indeed our first poll, I just want to let each of our speakers introduce themselves, uh, just to shed a little bit more insight and uh, light onto their respective roles and respective companies. So, Laurie, I'm going to come to come to you first. Thank you, Jack. I'm glad to be here. Uh, yes, I'm the Senior Corporate Compliance Officer at Bank of the West, and I'm based in San Francisco. Uh, in this role, along with my other business partners, I identify how uh, laws and regulations are applicable and the impact that they have uh, at a corporate and group level at the bank uh, related to the bank's social media activity. And um, so I also develop policies and procedures that test in our uh, testing of our controls, uh, and help in the development of uh, employee training. Before joining Bank of the West, I was with Wells Fargo, where I served as their primary enterprise risk consultant on enterprise social media strategies and activities. So uh, I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Thanks very much, Laurie. And I'm coming over to you, Rohit. here. Um, if you could, uh, if you could give us a brief overview, similar to Laurie, that would be great. Thanks, Jack. Um, we, um, Caffeine is uh, based in Silicon Valley. I'm the CEO of uh, Caffeine Inc. Um, so Caffeine provides a SaaS platform to proactively manage social conversations for better social risk management. And um, um, the, it's basically founded on the principles that the adopts, adoption of social media is increasing in the enterprise and its platform allows enterprises to better manage the risk, get a handle on the overall company sentiment, the social equity, which uh, allows you to gauge the influence your employees have in the social sphere, as well as get a handle to understand the compliance that they are adhering to in their organizations. So uh, with that, I look forward to this uh, webinar and get uh, the thoughts of the co-panelists. Thanks very much, Rohit. And finally, Lisa, over to you. I'd, I'd, I'd love if you could uh, uh, introduce yourself, of course. Oh, good morning, everyone, or maybe good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lisa Melton. I'm an assistant vice president with Amica Insurance Company. Uh, just to give a little bit of background about Amica, uh, many of you may not be familiar with us, but we are the oldest mutual insurer of automobiles in the country. We've been in business for 108 years. Um, we write all personal lines for individuals and their families. And I actually oversee our social media efforts here at Amica, so I work with a terrific team that uh, puts forth all of our content and connects with customers and engages. Uh, but I also have really strong relationships within the organization to uh, manage our risk and, and work on our compliance issues. So I'm, I'm very happy to be here and I look forward to the conversation. 
Thanks, Lisa. Uh, now, the issue of social media compliance is obviously a, a challenge one for many companies. That's, of course, why, why you're all here. And, and in my conversations with many senior executives in the build-up to the webinar, one thing that I kept hearing is, is the desire, really, for their, for their companies to fully embrace compliance, not just accept it, uh, sometimes begrudgingly. So this actually forms the basis of our first poll. Um, you can only select one answer, and I'll give you around about 15 seconds to do so. And as I say, it's, it's, it's very similar to, to what I just asked. So do you feel that your company has effectively embraced social media compliance? Do you feel that your company has effectively embraced social media compliance? You can either select yes or no. We're starting off with relatively simple, nice yes and no answer. Do you feel that your company has effectively embraced social media compliance? I'll just give you another five seconds to vote, if you could. Five, four, three, two, one. Thank you very much for all those who voted. That's fantastic. And you should have the poll results coming up on your screen now. Now, interestingly, it's, it's relatively even. So we have around about 60% saying yes, so the majority saying they have indeed effectively embraced social media compliance, whereas 40% uh, are saying that that is something still yet to happen. Um, Laurie, coming to you first, perhaps, uh, firstly, you could give us your thoughts on these results. Um, I'm not sure if they surprise you. But also, if you could outline what embracing social media compliance means to you. Well, I'm happy to see the results, and I wonder how many people are in compliance roles that are listening to the call. But um, to me, embracing social media compliance means that uh, you know when everybody owns their role in managing risk, then compliance um, tends to feel a little less like a relative that comes to visit for three weeks just when you're heading out the door on vacation. Uh, and, and, and more like a friend who helped you pack um, what you need to really have a good time. And I think, you know, uh, that, that that integration is really important. And the, mo the motivation is to, um, you know, to meet business goals, to strengthen, whether that's to strengthen the brand, you know, whatever the desired outcomes may be, and to do so with uh, minimal fallout and, uh, you know, and less of a uh, concern once um, your content is out there. So I, I think it's really about everybody having a you know having skin in the game and owning their role in managing risk Fantastic. And, and Rohit, I'll just come over to you. So really, in, in terms of um, your experience and, of course, your, your experience with the many brands that you work with, what, what does embracing social media compliance mean to you? And, and, and if you could kind of touch upon really what the motivation behind embracing compliance is. Yeah, Jack. So I think what we see is that, um, especially, and I'll speak from the enterprise perspective, uh, when we look at the fact that um, social media is, of course, going to have a different level of engagement based on the industry you're in. So for Laurie's industry, being financial services is much more uh, heavily regulated. So compliance takes on a different meaning. But uh, in terms of managing the risk that stems from social media, it does uh, go towards you know everybody having skin in the game, as Laurie said. But in addition, uh, it's also about empowering the employees to be able to engage safely in social media. And for that, uh, that requires that there be the uh, training programs uh, put in place so that uh, employees are aware of what their uh, duties are with respect to social media or, or obligations are with respect to uh, protecting uh, the reputation of the organization. So, so to kind of round it out, I think it's, it's a, uh, uh, to bring it together with the employees participating in uh, social media, but uh, the company also providing them the right guidelines and tools to make sure that's happening all around. Mm. And, and certainly, the, the, them actually empowering your employees in, in a safe way is something which is uh, uh, many people have actually emailed questions in beforehand. So we're looking forward to going into that in a little bit more detail. And you mentioned, of course, the importance of having a, a framework in place. And just coming over to, to you, Lisa, uh, you know, to what extent does Amiga actually have an established framework for social media compliance? Uh, well, I think. Again, we're a, we're a highly regulated industry as well, so we uh, have a very established framework. Uh, and, and one of the things I think that um, 
uh, we have a little bit of a benefit of is I spent the majority of my career at Amica on the operations side. So I worked within the regulatory frameworks. I understand kind of the whole compliance aspect and all the rules and regulations. So moving over to social was a relatively uh, easy transition and understanding, okay, here's what we can do, what we can't do. Here's what we can't say, what we can't say. Here are the, kind of the the real rules and, and understanding of, of the, the nature of our business. So I think really gaining that education is invaluable because I think for all of us, the last thing that we would want to do is, is risk our brands in any way. So, so there's a lot of knowledge and understanding. Um, we have kind of playbooks that we go by to ensure that we're doing what we, what we need to do listening strategies, customer privacy, all that sort of thing. We, we try to make sure that everyone understands what the ground rules are um, in order to make sure that we're effectively managing that risk and ensure that we're in compliance. And, and, and just to highlight, we've got a few questions coming through the chat box, which is fantastic. So if you, uh, please, if you have any questions, keep, keep uh, throwing them in. And actually, one of the questions that's just come through, and I'm going to come back to you, Laurie, and, and it's related specifically to actually establishing a, a framework for social media compliance. What are those first initial steps? So if you are a company kind of first venturing into, into, into social media, and, and, and of course, you know, compliance is a, is a key issue for you, what are the first steps a company can take to developing a sound framework upon which they can build? Sure. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a few, I think, probably critical steps that any company uh, could take. And, and one of them, I think, first that's important is really getting clear on um, what the social strategy is, you know, and what, what are those activities? What does that look like? And how, how um, far-reaching is it across the organization? Um, how are these strategies and activities being executed? Who are the partners? Who are those key stakeholders that are involved in this, and, and what roles do they um, do they serve? And uh, you know, when when you're risk assessed, you're considering those things as well as what existing controls you have in place, um, external factors. You know, as as we mentioned, such as the regulatory environment and policies and so forth, uh, to help you identify gaps. Uh, and then the gaps really need to be prioritized. And I think you know there's it's a, if there is a logical flow to it uh, if you're first starting out. And I also would say that there's likely other aspects of the business that undergo this process. So uh, you know to the degree that you're able to, uh, that framework you know should be considered where it, where it works elsewhere in the company. But um, that could be a good starting point. Fantastic. And, and coming over to you, Hope, Rohit, right was, was there anything that you'd like to add on that in terms of actually laying uh, the right foundations um, and, and those kind of initial first steps that, that one can take? Yeah, I mean, um, uh, Jack, when we kind of look at, there's uh, actually specific guidelines for how to go about doing it. Um, the first of those came about through the FFIEC uh, regulatory guidance, uh, which uh, quite clearly states that you know, organizations uh, should uh, have a governance structure with clear roles and responsibilities, uh, policies and procedures regarding the use of the social media, and, and also to ensure that all your uh, current and applicable uh, consumer protection laws, et cetera, are adhered to on social media just as any other um, uh, avenue that you might be using. Uh, and then also being very clear uh, in terms of an employee training program that uh, allows the institution to uh, work through what are the potential pitfalls of social media for the organization. Uh, but once all that is put in place, uh, a very key step is to also have an oversight process for monitoring the information and being able to react to it um, because it's not just about uh, you know, collecting this information because there are certain uh, requirements in terms of when uh, a certain uh, post is made uh, against or for your product that you are responding to it in a timely manner. So having that monitoring framework in place is equally important. And then, of course, being able to organize the information and being able to present it out for the audit and compliance functions and to be able to report that out to your senior management. So I think that with that kind of uh, seven-step type of process, you know, you have uh, what seems uh, onerous but will hold you in good stead if you put that, you know, process in place and use the right tools to be able to gather that information and be able to present it when needed. 
Fantastic. Thanks, Rohit. And, and, and actually, Lisa, I mean, we, both Laurie and Rohit um, mentioned a couple of kind of key challenges that, that, that you can sometimes face when, es when establishing this initial framework and then taking um, the, uh, compliance to the next level. In, in, in your experience um, at, at Amica, really, what was one of the biggest or perhaps most common challenges um, that, that you faced and that you know that other companies perhaps face when trying to establish uh, this kind of framework and these kind of procedures? I think one of the initial things uh, was really related to making sure the folks who are working in social understand the rules and regulations. Um, you know, that's always, it's, it's, and as, as Rohit mentioned, employee training is incredibly important and really kind of crucial to the overall brand protection and risk mitigation piece. So I think. You know, just getting everybody on board and really trying to understand what, what we can and we can't do. But I also think that there's, uh, there's always a challenge of keeping up with changing regulations as well. You know, there's, uh, there's new things that come on board. For us, there's a lot of state regulations we have to be, ensure or be sure that we're monitoring. Um, but also things like FTC guidelines that come down that might change the way we're doing things. It's just creating that awareness and, and being mindful of the fact that even though things are good and, and everything's in a good place, something could change that could change the way we do something. So it is, it's, it's, it's a good thing to be informed, and it's certainly something that keeps us on our toes. Um, but if it's managed properly and effectively, you know, it's really just the nature of doing business and social. Mm. Most definitely, obviously, one of, the, one of the biggest challenges in the social space is keeping up with the constantly moving goalposts, and when you have, um, a, I suppose, a constantly changing regulatory environment as well, it adds a, another, another piece to that pie. And actually, one of the questions that's just come through, and I'm just going to come to you, Laurie, on this one before we move on to our um, second poll. Um, do you think that reg the regulation will continue to proliferate? Um, an example is, for example, you know, in Canada, uh, it's just reduced um, uh, anti-spam laws. Uh, you know, will compliance resources impact on the bottom line uh, of, of your business, and do you think of businesses as a whole? Uh, absolutely. I, I, I certainly don't. I think that's not unique to any financial um, industry or a regulated industry. Uh, I think that um, you know we're continually in the process, and this is what Lisa was speaking about, is you know, there are changing regulations, and uh, you know that that changes uh, the way that we perceive risks uh, organizationally. Uh, some risks that that might have been might have surfaced as one of the greatest ones might then change positions with with something else, and that could be driven by many things: uh, strengthening controls, changes in regulations, a, a number of things, or activities that the financial institution engages uh, with. And, and one of the things that I, that I wanted to just mention um, as we were talking about this and kind of what kind of challenges companies can face when they establish a framework for compliance around social is that social is typically, um, not exclusively, but typically a business within a business and could reside in a lot of different places and organizations. It could be a part of the marketing group. It could be part of uh, the digital group or corporate communications. And, you know, compliance frameworks are often in place in other areas. And the challenge really is uh, true for everybody is that social is an equal opportunity, you know, kind of a experience across the enterprise that impacts every business, every employee. So you always need to be thinking about the different areas of impact, all the decision and connection points. And um, that typically, um, you know, would come out of the gap analysis that you, can, that you would conduct. So. Fantastic. Thanks very much. And, and, and it's a nice segue talking about, the, of course, the impact uh, that it can have on, on not only your bottom line, but, of course, your social strategy first and foremost. And that brings us to our second poll. Um, and it's trying to gauge the, the extent to which uh, the audience feels that uh, social media regulation and compliance actually restricts their social media strategy. Once again, so we, you can only choose one answer, and we have uh, four options uh, this time. And the question is, to what extent do you feel that social media regulation and compliance restricts your social media strategy. To what extent do you feel that social media regulation and compliance restricts your social media strategy? Uh, a, not at all. Um, B, not very much. C, to a reasonable extent. Or D, uh, very much so. It certainly does uh, restrict uh, what you're able to do with regard to your social media efforts. I'll just give you another five seconds uh, to finish voting.
thank you once again for all those uh, getting involved in the poll. And please, we, we are having questions coming in uh, thick and fast. I'm delighted that we're able to be integrating them in. So uh, any questions that you like to ask, do not sit there in silence. Please, please put them through the chat box. Once again, they are, of course, anonymous as well. Thank you to all those who voted. Um, you should have the results coming up now. So we have very, very few uh, stating that, of course, are not, uh, the, the extent to which they feel that social media regulation and compliance restricts their social media strategy, uh, only 6% say not at all. And again, no one is saying very much so, but there's a big band kind of between the not very much and, and the, of course, the winner to a reasonable extent. Um, firstly, coming to, uh, coming to you, Rohit, here, I mean, when it comes to um, your marketing strategy, um, often people consider compliance to be merely restricting one social strategy and it, as if a kind of straitjacket. I mean, how do you bring compliance into the mix whilst maintaining a, an effective and, and, and an efficient uh, marketing program and social program? Yeah, so, uh, you know, one of the things about uh, social, of course, when we think of marketing, we think of the company's corporate uh, Twitter handle. Uh, at Caffeine, we certainly believe that social um, is more effective when it's broader. Now, of course, with the industry that you're in and the regulations that might be there, uh, there's a certain amount of onus on you to be able to track everything that's being done, and so you may be restricted to trying to just use the, the official uh, corporate marketing handles. But uh, firstly, you know, to, to really be effective with social, uh, it needs to be as orga organic and authentic as you can make it because that's really why people are uh, following you because they want to kind of get things as they happen and see them as transparently as possible. So to, to really be able to leverage social effectively, uh, you want to have the ability to amplify uh, your message um, to, to whatever channels possible. Uh, your employees are definitely one of your biggest assets and brand ambassadors. And, and if they can participate, uh, that is uh, very much desired. Um, but on the other hand, since you need to manage the risk, uh, you do need to put in place, um, you know, as we talk about that governance structure, A, that they, they are uh, trained on what can and cannot be done on social media, uh, and two, if there are tools um, that you can use that can uh, keep the things within the guardrails of what is acceptable, then that will uh, that much help your program and also amplify your message uh, in in the direction that you'd want it to go. And um, so that's certainly some of the things that you um, want to think about is how do you craft a program where there are either uh, more employee ambassadors and, and you can maybe tap into them, those influencers recognizing who they are, and, and then also have that uh, training and risk management program so that you can uh, archive and collect all of their uh, data as well. Okay, so once again, making sure that the guidelines and the parameters are, are clear um, across the company from, from, from the bottom up, really. And again, we, we'll come to that in a little bit more detail um, in, in a short while. I mean, one of the things actually coming up on the, on the, on the chat box is actually uh, looking at the kind of level of review for, for, for content um, and pushing out content on social media. And I know for many conversations, people uh, kind of struggle often with um, actually knowing how much um, and, and, and what is considered an appropriate level of review when coming to content and social activity. So coming coming to you, Laurie, um, I mean, often there is a tendency for companies to perhaps over-engineer this. I mean, what does an appropriate level of review of content look like? And, and, and for you uh, at Bank of the West and also your experience um, at numerous other companies, you know, who, is, who, who should be doing this review? And what's the most, I suppose, efficient and effective way of, of, of entering into this process? So I think that uh, there's a couple of things that would influence this. Um, I think we have to always keep in mind that businesses manage risk every day. It's not new. Social didn't introduce new I mean, it introduced new risk, but it didn't introduce risk to a business. And you can easily over-engineer. So knowing your um, business uh, appetite for risk is important, but obviously it's just as important to know which regulations, policies, or other factors cannot you know, be compromised, where are those hard lines. Um, but, but you may have reoccurring campaigns that are launched on social which allow for a more expedited review, uh, providing you have a, first, a very strong first line of defense, and I think that's also important. So 
appropriate levels of review could vary, if, but if you have a very, very strong first line of defense and content sort of coming to you a little more clean and it's discussed earlier on as part of the overall campaign, that's often very um, helpful. Uh, you know, this, um, uh, the, and having those good controls in place. So this, this may fall within, ex expedited reviews may fall within your business's level of acceptable risk, potentially. Um, in terms of who reviews what, you know, content and social activity, they, you know, reviews fall into different buckets. So, and they, they warrant different reviewers. And some of them take a little longer than others because they, they need to maybe go through, you know, legal review, HR review, other, other groups might need to be weighing in. But it's um, shepherding that process in a smooth and efficient way and getting there, I think, is very instrumental. Fantastic. And, and actually, whilst we're on the issue of, um, you know, that kind of risk management side and, and, and who you actually consider as the first line of defense, I mean, uh, who is it for you, Laurie? And, 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 you know, is it compliance? I mean, is it the people, people creating the content? Um, who, I suppose, who is it for you and who do you believe it should be? Well, I, I think it's, I think it's, um, it kind of goes back to embracing <laughs> social media compliance. I think that the first line of defense is anybody who certainly touches content, or uh, there are third-party uh, service providers, they are, you know, um, product uh, developers, and, you know, you, you have, I might have high aspirations, but I would think that, that when people do uh, design and consider um, risk as part of this, uh, you know, as part of getting that out the door, then, um, yeah, I, I, think, I think that first line of defense is really that, you know, the very, very broad base of uh, employees as well as, like I said, third-party service providers potentially before it hits compliance review. Mm. Fantastic. And, and, and actually, just coming back to, to, the, to this issue of your view, and we will uh, kind of again look at the kind of risk management side in a little bit more detail. I mean, a, a lot of companies are looking for their uh, kind of Oreo uh, Super Bowl moment, but if you have uh, numerous uh, different levels of review that you have to go through before you can, you can tweet something as, uh, as real time as that, then obviously it slows up the process. So I'm interested, and, and coming over to, to you, Laurie, I mean, how um, have Amica really kind of built in efficiencies into your review process and your, your overall compliance process to, to make sure that I suppose you are as, as real time as, as you possibly can be? Well, I think um, for us it, it's a lot about communication and it's so interesting that, you know, as social practitioners we like to talk about having conversations with folks and it's about engaging and I think even as an organization it's ensuring that uh, we're communicating with people ahead of time. So I think, you know, Lori did a really nice job of kind of highlighting the fact that it, it really is kind of dependent on what the content is and the campaign is with regard to who sees it and how many levels. But I also think kind of sitting down with everyone who needs to be involved, helping them understand your social strategy, helping them understand your goals, understanding what some of their challenges are. I think that communication ahead of time can always help in ensuring that everyone's on the same page, people know what's expected, um, ensuring that, you know, someone's maybe not viewing or someone is, is a social practitioner may not be viewing compliance as kind of a negative, but just an understanding of this is the way we have to do things. So I think in kind of the Oreo moment, I would imagine that if, if that were us, we would have everyone that we would need sitting at the table in a war room trying to craft out whatever that message would be to ensure that that got out real time. Um, but I do, think, I do think a lot of the success in compliance and risk management focuses on communication. And, and it's so interesting how that seems to come back uh, over and over again, no matter what you do in business. So. It's exactly making sure everyone is indeed on the same page and, and, and uh, first and foremost and then kind of easing those internal communications and breaking down some of those traditional silos which of course can, can get in the way. Uh, but coming to you, Ro, here, I mean, actually developing sound internal compliance policies and processes across your enterprise can be difficult. I mean, numerous people have highlighted it and they, they still are on the, on the chat box. How can companies go about setting employee guidelines with regards to their social media usage? I mean, especially when it comes to, to companies who have global operations. I mean, how can they make sure that, that they're, they're going about that all their employees are, are know what, what the kind of parameters are and indeed that, that, that they are in, adhered to? So uh, the, the practicality of it is, you know, there are a lot of guidelines and 
um, you know, policies that employees have to adhere to. So uh, when it comes to social media, you know, it's quite easy that it gets buried under all of the other, you know, ethics and other compliance types of policies that employees know they they have to follow. And so um, many large organizations obviously have annual programs and certifications that the employees have to do. And uh, so, th so I think social will probably find its um, you know mark in in those uh, certifications that or uh, employees have to go through but uh, all said and done you know it's still the onus is on the organization to be able to um, you know effectively monitor that uh, those policies are being adhered to and that's uh, really uh, where caffeine comes in because caffeine is designed with the notion that um, while uh, social is mostly going to be uh, free of error and uh, we hope uh, impactful and positive for the organization uh, there is always uh, that risk and and uh, by being able to encode uh, every organization's uh, uh, social policy into its uh, rule engine a real-time rule engine uh, we can monitor and alert when there are any infractions if any so so I think it's a combination as we previously said about you know an effective training program but then also putting the governance structure, the tools to be able to capture what's needed. Fantastic. And I'd actually just like to bring Laurie uh, in on this specific issue. We've just had a question come through, which you just asked, uh, do you have any best practices or recommendations on how to uh, going about, you know, Rohit just, just touched on it perfectly, how to monitor ad adherence with social media policies? So in particular, how to identify and action employees using social media for business purposes without having received the, the required authorization? So that gets that does get pretty um, tricky because there are labor laws and you need to be careful of not just what, what you're monitoring but also what you're doing with that information, right? Um, and but I would first, I guess, I would say, and just to kind of circle back on the policy piece, you know, policies need to make sense and they're, you know, uh, they they need to be able to be complied with and they need to be tested again. And I think, uh, you know, you you know, you need policies, but you want your employees and third-party service providers to know what they mean, and that's you know, where are the blurred lines, what's, uh, what's permissible and what's not, and who they can go to for these tools and help and answers and stuff. And I think, um, you know, continue showing continual examples of how, you know, we talked a little bit about advocacy, employee advocacy on social. Uh, you know, listening programs enable you to pick up mentions of, uh, you know, ac across all social um, and web um, properties. But, you know, what do you do with that information is just as important with, um, ensuring that there's compliance with with various regs and regulation reg, regulations and with policies. I think that's not as I mean, well. It is a challenge, certainly on non-branded sites, or it can be. I think that uh, it's equally important to consider what you do with that information and and how it's used, what happens to the employees, and so forth. So um, yeah, we employ listening and monitoring programs that that enable us to uh, pretty quickly identify if there's um, non-adherence with, with policy and have a clear escalation path for those. Thanks, thanks, Laurie. And uh, then we're actually going to kind of move into a slightly deeper focus on, on risk management. Obviously, risk management it plays a huge role in protecting your social uh, brand. Um, and, and really, from the conversations that I've had, many have kind of recommended that, that um, uh, I suppose that initial stage needs to be actually conducting uh, a risk assessment of your entire business to, to, to be able to identify the, the biggest potential and, of course, current issues for you. Um, coming to you, Lisa, I mean, has this something, uh, is this something which, which you have indeed done? And, 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 and if so, how would you recommend a, a company goes about doing this? Because it seems a, a relatively comprehensive thing to do. Uh, yes, and I think... Um you know, Lori kind of set it up very nicely. And, and this is actually one of my favorite parts of kind of the social compliance world is that I, I think people understand that there's risk associated with being in social and being active in social. And, and as, you know, Lori mentioned earlier, it's kind of understanding what your, your appetite is for that. But I also think there's such an amazing opportunity for social to help with risk management. And one of the ways that we've gone about this is really through our listening strategy. So 
um, monitoring what's being said about us, understanding what the sentiment is on our brand. We've been, uh, with our listening platform, we're able to tag topics of conversation, you know, what, what's happening, what it's related to, so that we can really understand and get a good framework of how our brand is viewed externally. And because we're listening all the time, it really allows us to see some early warning signs of anything that might be emerging from a risk perspective. Um, but there's also so many opportunities in social to uh, understand what the risk is and understand what's being said, but also maybe to correct some inaccuracies should something happen and, and provide a more accurate set of information. So I do think um, Listening is just such an important part of an overall listening strategy, an overall risk management strategy, and um, I, I think it really is important to have the right tool to do that as well. So that's certainly one, one way that we've, we're constantly monitoring what the, um, the perception externally is of our brand that really helps us allow us identify trending, um, and really get a good sense of what people are saying about us. Mm. As you say, putting, putting your fingers in your ears is certainly not going to help anyone. There isn't no. a conversation about your brand going on out there. Um, it, 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 seems, it seems silly not to be part of that and at least trying to be uh, contribute and, and, and kind of sculpt that conversation as well. Uh, coming over to you, Ro, here, I mean, in terms of this initial stage of actually um, conducting a risk assessment of your business um, and, and going about identifying what perhaps are the, are the biggest and potential uh, issues for you that, 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 that could um, escalate, I mean, how, how, how uh, have you experienced companies go about doing this and what are the most effective ways of doing so uh, when it comes to social um, risk, um, so certainly as Lisa pointed out, listening to the brand sentiment uh, is uh, sometimes an early warning indicator of what else might be percolating out there. But uh, with caffeine, we, we focus uh, very uh, clearly on the risk from employee use of social media. And, and with our tools, we are able to uh, create a uh, person uh, profile of their use of social media and 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 that too um, without uh, obviously violating any of the uh, privacy disclosures that employees need to go through and and using uh, that to kind of um, implement the social media guidelines for the organization creating the alerts you know so by using those techniques we kind of focus on the risk from the employee use of social media Mostly because, you know, so let's say as an example, and, and, and I uh, was to say like Apple, you know, everybody loves Apple and they, you know that they keep their launches fairly, you, you know, to themselves till, till the very date. And, but how, however, the market always has rumors of uh, things that might be uh, planned by Apple in the upcoming launch. And of course, you know, anybody out there can start talking about the launch of a favorite new uh, Apple gadget, um, but it has no credence because nobody in the organization has ever mentioned it. However, if an employee was to use that phrase or word or color in, in their social media posts, uh, suddenly it gives it a lot more credibility. And, and so with caffeine, we essentially uh, focus in on ensuring that the risk that you have is a lot greater when your employees endorse something versus what the market might be saying. So, so that's an angle that I think, uh, it, it, from a risk perspective, it, it is very valuable. And, and, and I think as you uh, kind of alluded to right here, I mean, it's not just uh, about identifying what your, your biggest external risks are, but also internally as well. But, but also it's important to establish what you consider an acceptable level of risk. I mean, certainly, I'm, I'm going to come to you, Laurie, on this. I mean, you, you certainly can't just uh, <laughs> put the whole company on lockdown. You, you know, the, you have to be able to throw um, an element of caution to the wind. How, I suppose, uh, the, the question is, is, is how do companies go about drawing the line and actually saying, well, this is indeed an, an acceptable level of risk, however, um, this, is, this indeed is not? Well, um, that's a great question. You know, Social has done uh, a really great job of, um, I think, you know, 
asking companies to look at their risk appetite in very new ways and uh, be because of its nature, you know, and and yet, you know, you, know, you must. Um, so I, I think that, you know, while you, you know, I think talking about acceptable levels of risk should be occurring at the strategic level and into the activities level so that it's not each time feeling like, uh, and which doesn't mean it will never happen, but it, it will feel less like each time something is brought forward, it's like, oh, no, no, we can't do that. When that, you know, when that early uh, engagement at where it really matters and, and people share that common understanding, and I'm not really trying to skirt this issue, but I don't think there's a real hard answer, but I think where those discussions should happen is early on. And, uh, and like I said, that kind of helps to prevent those 11th hour, um, you know, uh, the brakes being slammed on uh, and, it's, and causes a lot of surprise and a lot of anxiety. So uh, I think the level of acceptable risk can and often can change uh, based on the, um, the control, the, uh, you know, the various, various factors. But again, I think early on so that people understand even at a baseline what that is uh, enables it to feel um, you know, like there's a way to get to yes, potentially. Which is the goal. I mean, which should be everybody's goal. Is that you know that that should be the common goal. It's like just saying no for no sake because it feels risky, and it's unfounded. Is also pretty dangerous. And I think that you know as long as there's dialogue, and I think you know our, the other speakers have mentioned it too. That communication is so critical um, with partners. Exactly, and as you rightly pointed out, you know, just just saying everything is 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 a, uh, a potential risk. Therefore, um, you know, it would it would uh, it would lead to a very very um, uh, kind of boring strategy as a whole, um, and in that in itself is is very very risky. And just throwing that one over to you, Lisa. I mean, uh, obviously you're working in a in a highly regulated industry. I mean, how how do you uh, and 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 the company as a whole go about um, actually? measuring what is a, a kind of acceptable level of risk when it comes to um, uh, not only um, kind of what your employees can um, can share about the brand externally, but also the brand itself. Uh, you're throwing a lot of hard questions out here, Jack. And Apologies, you know, I, I know, know this is just a big one for, a, for, a, for a Thursday morning. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It's a tough thing to answer. I think... Um, you know, as Lori mentioned, it's just kind of flushing it out in a lot of communication. Um, but, you know, someone once said to me, and, and believe me, I'm, I, I'm not a sports person. I don't really follow sports. But it's, it's something related to the fact that people, you don't score a touchdown by running down the middle of the field. So when you think about compliance, it's kind of like you're, you're in the middle of the road. You score it by kind of going down the sidelines and running to the goal down the sidelines. And it is that almost sideline view of, of how far is everyone comfortable going and having those conversations in order to get that touchdown. And, and playing along the sidelines but not quite getting out of bounds too often. Um, and I, I do think that that really, it's almost at times a little bit of a gut check. Um, to ensure that you're you're where you need to be, but it is a lot about ensuring that it's not just what you're doing in social, but if it's relating to anything else within the organization, making sure that everybody's comfortable with that. So um, I think a lot of brands these days are very active in social, and, and it's really become part of an overall business strategy. You know, it's social business, not necessarily social media. So the last thing I know for us that we would want to do is um, take a little bit too much of a risk and then have others within the organization view it as a negative. So we try to we try to kind of skirt the sidelines a bit, but still maintain our boundaries to ensure that we're we're pushing, we're um, doing things not just status quo all the time, but staying within the guidelines of what we need to be doing. It's, it's a tough question. Um, and I definitely think it, it speaks to the communication aspect of, of the comfort level and ensuring everybody's agreeing with that strategy. And that was a that was a very good answer for such a difficult question, and I especially like the sports analogy. Um, I think that worked very very well, especially to someone who, uh, who uh, admittedly, uh, you said that you're not into sports. But actually, <laughs> just, and, and as we kind of moving towards our uh, the kind of final part of the webinar, very I'd love to come over to you. And I mean, we mentioned the importance 
of social listening, both externally and, of course, internally as well, making sure that you are aware of any um, uh, breaches and compliance uh, from your employees. And, and really, that's ultimately the aim of, of identifying a particular issue before it escalates. And how, how can companies go about monitoring not only internally but also externally their, their community to make sure that they are one step ahead of the conversation but and, and able to, to spot potential threats and then of course you know once once you are able to identify that how can you how can you kind of uh, limit the, the damage that c it can be done and, and kind of lock it down at, at that particular stage great so, so that's uh, um, um. The way, I mean, we envision um, organizations using social and especially with the adoption of social growing at such a rapid pace is uh, social as, in fact, Lisa mentioned, isn't just social media, it's a business. And, and it's an integral part of your business. And I think to kind of uh, keep uh, social away from uh, the maximum exposure would be doing disservice to the organization and by that I mean um, social isn't just for some of the authorized users I mean your employees are doing social um, they might not have the company handle but uh, it's very much understood that um, any employees can subject an institution to uh, reputational risk because um, you know uh, every enterprise should be aware that employee communications, even personal ones, uh, on uh, social media will be construed and can be construed by consumers as official policies. So if um, you have these policies in place, uh, you want to kind of uh, make sure your employees, um, while they're participating, you also are aware that whatever they're saying and doing, which you may not be aware of, um, the consumers out there uh, think they are endorsed by you in in some ways because um, you know just by notating that they work for your organization they become ambassadors of your brand so why not harness them uh, why not actually um, you know get them in your program and and then when you get them in the program it, it's when, when they're part of your program, you have a better chance of understanding uh, what they're talking about and, and to uh, be able to guide them better, uh, etc. So in terms of like as these um, uh, identification of these threats, so um, the point I'm trying to make is that by letting your, um, because a lot of the risks are not going to stem from your official use because um, you know, in marketing, uh, Lisa is very aware of, you know, all the regulations and what can be said and what can't be said, who the stakeholders are, who she needs to get, you know, involved up front. But uh, the risk many times can stem from people who are kind of on the uh, periphery and, and are still employees of the organization and may, may make a casual comment about something that had they been better involved in the process uh, would know better. Um, so I, I think that itself is one of the things that can help spot these potential threats is to engage your um, uh, you know, ambassadors into your program and then be able to uh, monitor their activity. And, and by them participating, they'll, they'll become more voluntary participants into your uh, monitoring uh, program as well. Um, but the, the other incentive is they get recognized for the contribution that they might be making to your company's brand because uh, 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 let's recognize they're, they're helping your brand by doing and chatting about uh, stuff that relates to work, promoting your organization, and, and they get recognized for that. And, and so by being more involved, uh, you can actually have a better handle on it uh, and then we can also have uh, processes in place to, and, and certainly with caffeine we can, where uh, if they use the tool that's been made available to the organization for posting their social content, uh, it can be reviewed before it goes out uh, if, if it's anything related to uh, their uh, business. So, so I think uh, to, to potentially stop these things, you need to obviously put in place programs that will help you identify these things beforehand through training and, and these tools. But um, then, when an incident does happen, what do you do? Well, there I think it comes to a, an organization 
um, you know, showing its character, recognizing the fault, uh, making sure they're transparent about the issue, um, and reacting very, very quickly. And, and to do so also uh, requires to mitigate that risk that you become aware of that risk um, uh, practically in real time because, you know, social, one of the things about the risks from social is that they are, they, are they, they can propagate very quickly, right? The velocity of this risk is probably the highest of, of, of uh, the other forms of communication risks that exist out there. It's global, it's, it spreads like wildfire, and, and so the quicker you can catch it and, and recognize it, uh, the better off your organization is going to be. And, and you actually make a perfect segue into uh, uh, the, the, our kind of uh, penultimate question. And if no matter what you're doing, and, and, and in actual fact, there, as you, as you rightly point out, there's numerous processes and frameworks and, and tools that you can put into place to make sure that you uh, uh, reduce the, 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 the amount of potential crises that, that occur. But as we all know, sometimes you know, that, that it will happen regardless. And, and coming over to you, Lisa, I mean, in, in terms of training and, and, and procedures or processes that one can put in place to make sure that your team can consistently uh, react and, and ensure that the, 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 this issue is dealt with um, quickly and, and, and and efficiently. I mean, what are the kind of steps that, that one can take to make sure if, if it does if it does go wrong, um, you, you can react as quickly and effectively as possible? Yeah, I, and I think um, you know, overall, when we look to these types of situations that occur, and thankfully, knock on wood, um, there have been very few in my tenure at Amica, but. Um, you know, we have an overall kind of crisis communications plan in place, and uh, when and if a situation occurs, we always leverage that. So we ensure that um, we're looking at the situation, we're getting the right people involved with regard to whatever it might be, whether it's a claim, whether it's a, a coverage issue, whether it's something completely unrelated. Um, and ensuring we're having conversations with those folks to get a full understanding of what the situation is so that we can work together with our PR teams and other folks to develop a response plan. And, um, and it really is kind of leveraging uh, the overall plans that organizations have and ensuring that, um, you know, you can manage through a crisis. And again, it could be really anything. We, we've as an organization, we, we have business continuity plans, business resilience plans. Uh, we've had exercises to see how we handle those things. And all of that kind of tests our response and social you know, involved in all of it. So uh, I do think that understanding uh, the workflows and understanding the, the plans that are in place at organizations is crucial in being able to quickly and swiftly um, address anything that might be occurring. And again, I, I feel like I sound a little bit like a broken record, but, but it is a lot about communications. You know, when we work with our business partners, we make sure, uh, and we introduce them to the things that we're doing on social, we make sure that they understand if we're reaching out to them for something, we need a quick, we need it, we need it back quickly. You know, this is a public forum, it's online, it can escalate very quickly. Uh, so they know that if something comes over from us, that it's kind of drop everything, take a look at it, let's figure out what's going on. So, so I do think there's a big communication factor in that as well. As you, write, as you already pointed out, having that plan, easing the communications, but also running through perhaps kind of scenario-based examples. Um, so if it, when it does when it does happen for real, you, you, you everyone uh, kind of knows where they need to be and, and knows what what they need to do. Um, as, as our final kind of final question, Laurie, I'm going to come to you. And um, unfortunately, we, we, we're just rapidly running out of time, which is such a shame. Again, this could go on for a lot longer. But uh, Laurie, do, do you see any big changes on the horizon when it comes to social media compliance and, and risk management um, and, and, and any kind of big changes perhaps that you do see, what does that mean for your company and, 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 and for, for, for many companies out there? Uh, yeah, I, I, think that, well, I think that in the financial industry we can, it's safe to assume that there could be more consumer regulations on the horizon or other, other um, security issues or other things that are going to be security issues that would impact everyone. But, so I think we're going to see more of, certainly more of that, but we'll also see more people engaging through social and mobile as their primary channel of communication. So in a lot of ways, it's, uh, 
it's going to um, maybe impact uh, the business model in terms of uh, you know channels where uh, customer service is uh, offered um, to, to customers or consumer complaints are managed. Uh, so, and I also think that just creates greater opportunity in really positive ways. So, more people engaging through social and mobile is a great thing. And uh, you know, managing the changing uh, regulatory environment will be um, obviously would have some impact in our world. Fantastic. Thanks, Roy. And then, and finally, Ro here. I mean, in terms of uh, any big changes uh, that, that you perhaps uh, predict, if, was, if you're going to get your prediction hat on, and, and then a, a couple of tips that, that you might recommend in terms of uh, uh, dealing with those with, the, with this change. The only um, prediction I'd make is that change is a constant. So we, we, we will uh, try to keep up with it as, as uh, new regulations come and certainly you know financial services has uh, led the way as, as it uh, has in the past in many other areas uh, but it's certainly something that the regulations uh, social are coming up uh, in uh, healthcare and and through the basic FTC guidelines it's really applicable to a broad range of uh, organizations so uh, you know what I would recommend is certainly you know, uh, look into your social practices, be ready to make sure your social policies are up to date and uh, allow you to, um, you know, essentially be uh, up to speed on the regulations uh, that are going to uh, impact you. Fantastic. And, and, and Lisa, I know you wanted to just quickly, quickly pitch in, in, in at the end there as well. And I think the only thing I wanted to add is that I think one of the things that we'll see is that organizations will use social to leverage risk or use leverage social to monitor risk management more and see the value of social and and keeping a pulse of the organization and what the risk of the brand is I mean again I think that's truly one of the one of the big benefits of social is that it does allow that opportunity for for kind of proactive risk management so thanks right, and, and and, and I, I think that's a lovely way to end, actually, you know, rather than uh, on, on a kind of positive note of, of obviously the opportunities that social media provides in, in many different aspects, uh, risk management being one of them. Um, uh, thank you again to, to all our speakers for, for, for their insight and, and then, of course, their, their great answers. And really what's been nice about today's discussion are the differing perspectives, not only of our speakers, but also the numerous different people getting involved uh, through the chat box as well. Um, Unfortunately, given the time, it is now at the end of our questions and the end of today's webinar. I know we've gone over slightly, as uh, as can often happen when uh, when we're talking about something as, uh, as as interesting and, and important as we have done. Um, apologies if I was unable to get round to your question. We did have quite a few coming through, um, but we've had some fantastic engagement and interaction uh, with the discussion uh, and loads of loads of questions flying in. So thank you, thank you all for that, and of course getting involved in the polls as well. I'd, I'd like to thank our speakers again um, uh, for their involvement, so Laurie, Rohit, and Lisa, uh, for, of course, their insight and their contributions. Um, and before everyone leaves uh, to get a, a well-deserved coffee, um, we will be sending out the recording of the webinar next week, so no worries uh, if, if you perhaps missed uh, any part of the discussion. Uh, what's more, if you still have a question um, and you would like to ask any of our speakers in person, they will indeed be speaking alongside 40 other uh, leading corporate executives in the social space at the 6th Annual Corporate Social Media Summit New York on the 15th and 16th of June. Uh, you can see on your screen now some of the brands uh, that will be speaking and sharing their best practice on the summit. And also, I'll just send through a link uh, to the summit website in the comment field as well. So please do check out the, the full speaker lineup and, and the comprehensive agenda as well. Um, thank you once again for everyone uh, for joining us. And thank you uh, again to our speakers. And I hope everyone has a great rest of their day. Bye-bye.